This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. This is Bill Kennedy, and our special guest today is Ken Wimberly. Hey, Ken, how are you doing? Dynamite, how are you doing? Hey, man, where are you talking to us from today? Fort Worth, Texas. Ah, Fort Fort Worth. Oh, not, I don't go to Texas very often. My my sister and a niece live in Austin, but I, I don't really get, I guess I fly through there on American all the time. <laughs> I guess I- Where are you? I'm in Miami. Oh, very nice. I'm in Miami, so that's like a hub for American. So I've probably been in Texas a lot more than I realize. But you never leave the airport, right? <laughs> spend a little time in Texas. Come, come hang out on some ranches and do some fun stuff. You know, we got, I got some um, hunting land in Kentucky. Nice. So uh, my business partner loves that stuff. He loves being out there. Oh, that's heaven to me. Yeah, we, we, just, we just bought 300 acres in January, and I'm trying to spend as much time as I can out on that land. Yeah. Is that in Texas you bought that land? Yeah, about, a, about an hour and a half away from Fort Worth. Nice. Nice. Yeah, my business partner. I, I think I'm more of a city person. I kind of like walking, not driving, and having access to like, I don't know, espressos and people. So <laughs> I, 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 I try. You know, the big problem for me was going in the woods in the summer and having all those insects. Like, I, it didn't work for me. My business partner laughed at me. He was like, "There's no big deal." I'm like, "Dude, come on." <laughs> all right. So that's uh, no, a fun of that. Okay. So can. Give everybody like the one or two minute elevator pitch on what you're doing today. So we get a sense of kind of where you are today. Yeah. So today I'm spending my life seeking to do projects that, that are significant in the world. And so really in, in, with my journey that's brought me today, it's two things. And it's all about love. So if you look at my license plate, it says love, love, L-O-V-E, L-U-V. And what that represents is the two companies that, that I founded and I'm running. One is, is called Legacy of Love. It's a parent to child journaling platform that you know, is, is designed to help families connect more deeply, to help uh, people to pass their stories on to future generations. So that, that's one love component. The second love component, L-U-V, is laundry love. So with a couple of partners and I uh, co-founded a chain of laundromats called Laundry Love. We, our first one's been open oh, about two and a half years. Our second recently opened, our third is under construction and we're negotiating on real estate for numbers four and five right now. So with Laundry Love, we are trying to be much more than a laundromat and, and become a kind of beacon of the community and a community center. We build beautiful, really bright, clean, spacious, um, friendly, inviting places. And they're about 6,000 square feet on average. And each one has a children's play area and a children's literacy area in the laundromat so that when parents come in, their kids have a fun, safe place to go. They can pick up a book, they can read, and we encourage those kids to take books home with them because what we've learned in the demographics in the areas where laundromats are typically located, um, there are very few households that actually have books for their children to read in, in those neighborhoods. So we're trying to make a little bit of a dent in that where we can and where we operate. I, I have a ton of questions there, but I'm going to wait until we get we get kind of near the end of, of the, the conversation. So when we get back to this, and I got a bunch of cool questions there. All right. A um, couple other questions here as we get started. I'd like to ask this just to get a time frame for everything. What year did you graduate high school? I graduated in 1987. It gives you a sense of like what the world is like there. 88. So. 88. All right. So we're the same age. Okay. We're the same age. 51, 52. Yep. Okay. Brilliant. 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 All right. Uh, I, I, I normally interview people that are in, in tech, software developers, um, people that are working on, uh, you know, operations and stuff. And uh, I'm not clear if you're doing any of the software development on these apps. Personally doing the software development? No. I, it's, but I am the founder. I'm a non-tech founder non-technical founder. I have a, a development team that's helped me along the lines on that. And, you know, we can talk all day long about the challenges of being a non-tech founder and, uh, 
that's not an easy thing to do necessarily. Um, uh, my son can actually code. He's gone to a local MIT summer camp and coding camp. He's he's pretty good at that stuff. He can build websites. He can do a bunch of stuff. But I'm um, I'm not quite as smart or savvy as he is. All right. So what so what I'm going to do is kind of change up my my first question here. And I and I what I really want to kind of get an understanding is maybe going into ninth grade high school, right? Like the high school is. But I tell my kids, and people have heard this before, uh, you know, from the time you start high school, you're on a four-year cycle. And if you somehow get off that four-year cycle, you fall back with all of your peers, right? If you don't graduate on time, your, your friends have, you're not, you're, you're falling behind. If you don't, the next step is four years, the next step is four years. So I kind of want to start when you're entering into high school. What, what's what's kind of going on with Ken? Are you... You're in Texas, so are you playing football? Is that what's happening now as you get into, what are your interests like, kind of as you're entering high school? I love diving in. This is a fascinating little story. And it's, it starts at, at 12 years old, older than, or younger than, than most people would. It, at 12 years old, I, uh, so I was raised in a single parent household. My parents got divorced three years old. Probably first memory of my life was them getting divorced and uh, raised by my mom mostly. Saw my dad, you know, kind of typical 70s custody arrangement with every other weekend and a couple weeks during the summer. Mom was a wonderful, loving mom, but she was also an alcoholic, spent a bunch of time just kind of doing her thing. And so we were what in the 70s was called latchkey children. You're probably familiar with that um, term there. And so we spent, my sister and I spent a ton of time just kind of on our own, figuring shit out and doing our own thing. And Fast forward, I was 12 years old, and at 12 years old, I watched the movie Taps. So Tom Cruise's very first movie uh, about a military school. And um, after watching that movie, I remember a buddy of mine and I watched that movie together. After watching the movie, we both went to our respective parents and said, I want to go to military school. Wow. And so this is 12 years old. My mom at first said, uh, I mean, you're, you're crazy. That's a terrible idea. You know, let's forget about that. But... A few months later, I think she started noticing kind of the trajectory of my grades, the people I was hanging out with. Um, she came back to me and said, hey, you still thinking about that military school idea? I was like, well, not really, but now you bring it up, let's reconsider it. And uh, uh, six months later, I was at Kemper Military School in Boonville, Missouri at 12 years old in eighth grade. So entering, entering into eighth grade. I'm going to be I'm going to be interrupting you throughout because I don't want you to go too fast here. And I always got kind of interesting questions. And I want to hear a little bit about that. But just before we get into it, was that military camp everything you thought it was going to be by the time you were out? It's fascinating. Probably one of the best things I've ever done. It, it, it literally gave me the foundation of who I am being there. And like, I hated it when I was first there. It was, uh, I don't know if you ever watched a movie called Lords of Discipline. So around, mm, no, I don't think so. Around that same eighties, mid eighties, uh, time frame, there was a movie that came out called Lords of Discipline and it was um, filmed at the Citadel and just kind of about the insane hazing that kind of goes on at these military academies. And it was exactly true. <laughs> it was exactly true. And so it, um, it was a rough place to be. I would, I, I long said that I'd never send my own children to a place like that, uh, but I wouldn't have traded it for myself. It was, I, I wanted discipline. That's, I mean, I, I'm the one that raised my hand to say, I want, I would, you know, of the 300 and some odd people that were enrolled in Indian time in, in that school, it was maybe five to 7% that volunteered to be there and the rest were kind of sent there. And I was in that little five to 7%. But this was, this was over the summer or you, you switched to go to school there? Four years of my life I spent there. Okay. So you changed schools at, at 12. You said, I want to go to school here. I flew from Missouri or from, from uh, Texas to Missouri and I lived there. I came home for Thanksgiving and I came Thanksgiving, Christmas and summer break. Barring that I was living at school there. Ah, uh, so that was going to be your junior and high school. So that was my 8th, ninth, 10th, and 11th grade year. I skipped my senior year. So I um, took, as I was going through school there, I advanced kind of as far and as fast as I could through the military ranks right there. But in addition to that, I started taking extra uh, correspondence courses. So literally, I, I get little books of, of 
classes that I could take in advance and take correspondence courses to earn credit faster than I could normally earn the credit. Um, because as much as uh, I kind of enjoyed the process of being at that school, I was like, yeah, I just didn't get out of here earlier. And if I can skip a year <clears throat> and kind of thought through this a couple years early, if I can skip a year, take some extra courses, I'm going to do that. I get you saying, I'm going to graduate early to get out of here. But why couldn't you just say, Ma, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm leaving. Oh, I could. I, I, I very much could. I mean, it was, in fact, my, after the very first, it was here, I rarely get into this part of the story. Uh, <laughs> I almost kind of forget about it. It's just, it, it's not part of the narrative. After the first semester and the absolute beat down and the terror that comes along with the hazing and, and everything there, I said, you know what, I'm not coming back. I said, I'm, I'm done with this place. Uh, and I remember uh, a mentor of mine who kind of took me under his wing. He drove me to the airport as I was leaving for that semester. And I was like, well, it's good to see you. you know, adios. And he's like, oh, you'll be back. I was like, I'm not coming back. He's like, you'll be back. And sure as shit. So I, I, I actually <laughs> didn't go back that second semester. The, the next semester, I stayed at home. But it didn't, as I was just around all the same people doing the same thing again, I was like, man, these are not the people I really want to be hanging out with and, and what I want to do. And so sure enough, I, I went back. And so I, I went back and, and finished the next three years out there and, and finished it. So while I wanted to get done earlier, I didn't want to leave just in, until I was finished and completed my degree. I sense you felt like you wanted to be around, even though I pledged a fraternity and I call it the best time I never want to have again. And, and I'm getting that sense from you. It was like the best time you never, ever want to have again, right? Very much like that. <laughs> and you just wanted to be around those people. I, I imagine you felt at the time that those were successful people. Somehow you had it in your head that success was kind of measured against that. And you didn't see it when you came back home. You know, they were disciplined people and look, uh, as I mentioned, most of them were there against their will, right? Their parents had sent them there, but it was people that were figuring it out, that were learning leadership, that were learning skills, were learning, you know, drill team skills. I and mean, we we're, we did some cool stuff there. And, um, and, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the, the camaraderie that came with it because, you know, when you go through, uh, much like if you go do some you know, crazy races or adventure races, or if you're in war together, if you go, and, and you're, you know, in a really tough position or place together with someone, you have this common bond of experience. And so we had that common bond of experience together. And, you know, today, 30 plus years later, a bunch of us still get together every year and kind of uh, have a little reunion. The school closed probably 10, 15 years ago. And but there a bunch of us will fly out to uh, Boonville, Missouri every year and get together and just kind of commiserate in, in the old days. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, I got a, I have, I have five kids, okay? Seven now that I'm married, I've got two stepkids. They're the youngest. But my, my boys, which are like 18 and 19, they couldn't care less about discipline right now. It is like pulling teeth. And I don't want to say it's generational or anything, right? Because I, 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 was, I wasn't a good student. I, I really didn't care about any of that stuff. But... You keep using the word discipline at 12 years old. And so I, I'm just kind of curious, where did this desire to have discipline, where I guess you felt it was, it was coming from at that point? I think it was the pure lack of it, honestly, that I was raised, and I mentioned that kind of term, latchkey term. We could do whatever the hell we wanted, anytime. And as a, okay, as a parent, it's important that we give our kids discipline. It is really important. They need the structure. They need the discipline. They need the guardrails up. I didn't have that. And, you know, I didn't know that that's what I wanted. It's, it's only looking back on all of this years later that I really kind of take it in context. I'm like, that's what, I, that's why I wanted to go to military school. I needed, I needed structure. I needed guidance. I needed discipline in my life and I didn't have it. And it has made me again into who I am today. I'm, you know, my friends and people that know me, they're like, you are the most structured, disciplined person I know. It, the, the way I've seen it, I, the way I kind of see it from a, being a parent is that kids feel most secure and safe when there's a routine. The younger they are, the more structured the routine has to be. When that routine is being broken, that's when they start to have fear and they start to kind of uh, have unknowns, right? The older you get, you can have a let. But as the younger you are, 
So I, I, maybe some of that discipline has to do with, I, I, I want to be on a routine that I know tomorrow morning I'm going to go on that same routine and there's safety in that. There is. So going to a military school and doing the correspondence work, I'm getting a sense that you were not thinking military after school or were you? I wasn't. And I, let's say I, I was and I was I actually applied to the Citadel. Um, and so I had to go get a, a senator, senatorial nomination to get in there and, and got accepted, applied and got accepted to Citadel. I graduated Kemper, again, 16 years old. I graduated, I was valedictorian in my class. And before deciding on what college to go to, and I was accepted to Citadel and a few other places, um, I said, you know what? I don't want to go to the Citadel. I want to go, I've been four years at a almost all male military school. I want to go chase girls and be in college, right? But you're 16 at this time, or yeah, yeah. I turned se I turned 17 a month after I graduated high school. Okay, all right, all right. Going to university at 16 would have would not have been. Well, even at 17, it was weird. So this is okay. This is what happened. So I graduate, um, top of my class. I go to Texas A&M uh, the next semester. During the summer between the two, I meet this girl and just get into this hot and heavy relationship with her, and it's. You know, we're both young. But where did you meet the girl? There? It's at, at, at no, Texas I met her at home. And it, during, That's during what the... I'm thinking, because you said summer. So, so you did a semester there. You come home for the summer. You meet this no, girl. No, no, but before I go to A&M. So between oh. graduating high school, before I go to A&M, I meet this girl. We start this relationship. And we're both young. And we're, we don't know squat about relationships anyway. And, and um, we argue a lot. But there's just a lot of physical passion there. So I go away to school and I'm coming back every weekend to see this girl. It's like the first real girlfriend I've, I've had there. And I'm like, I, I come back home every weekend. We have these arguments and I, you know, I see red, I can't focus on anything. So I go from valedictorian to 1.2 on my first semester of college. So, so it was, uh, it was a good wake up call, for, but it, the point, like I'm 17, all my friends are still in high school. Um, I don't know anyone there. I'm living with a guy who's a senior. He was my physician's son, living with him while I'm down there. And uh, he's a nice enough guy, but it's not like I'm hanging out with his senior friends. And so it was a weird experience being in college there. So after that, I came home for about two years and just went to junior college uh, before I finally made it to TCU, where I graduated at, at TCU. I started university at 17, and my first semester I had a .9. Mainly because it, it mainly because it was so cold out. I, I went to upstate New York. I didn't know how cold it was. I just didn't want to go outside that first semester, you know. So I get it. There's like an immaturity level that uh, I wasn't ready for. You know, somehow I ended up graduating only an extra semester, right? But there's a maturity level to to school too. So it seems like you had it when you were at the military camp and. I think you finally allowed yourself to be a kid for like a year, you know? I did. I kind of went wheels off and just, uh, you know, did a bunch of things I hope my kids will not repeat and follow and uh, had a good time. You know, I think that all the time and my kids have been good, but at, at the end of the day, it's those mistakes that have gotten you where you are. So do we not want them to make mistakes? Like, it's tough. I get it. Yeah, I want them to make their own. Right? That's what I kind of tell them. Make your own mistakes. Don't don't make the same dumb ones that I made. So, but you know, in in I forgot. I kind of left out in the middle of my college career because you mentioned before, probably didn't plan a career in the military, and I did not. But in the middle of my college career, um, when I was at TCU, we went to war with Iraq, and it was I, I remember sitting on my buddy's couch watching. When President Bush was, you know, we're launching the military strikes and, and uh, marching into Baghdad. And I went down the next day and I enlisted in the Navy. So I was sitting there watching that. I'm like, look, you know, my mom's struggling to pay for college. I'm, you know, doing okay, but I'm, you're just kind of here. What am I doing in my life? I start a little soul searching, go down the next day and I enlisted in the Navy. And so for the next, you know, four years, I, I spent uh, time in the Navy and, Lived in Japan for a couple of years. Okay, time out, time out. Do, do, so, so, I remember when that was all over the TV because we were in university wondering about our grades because where our GPAs weren't like really good. And we were like, Am I going to get drafted? Oh, oh my God, like we're like second in line after all the kids that didn't go to university. What's going on here? Like we were the complete opposite. We didn't, we weren't thinking about, we were worrying about 
what happens if we get drafted? So you're what? Okay, you're at TCU at the time. This is like '89, right? This is like '89. It is '89. Yeah. Yeah, and you're 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 you haven't. Right as we're turning into ninety, because my my military service was like ninety to ninety four. So right right as we're turning into yeah, it's like eighty nine ninety. I remember. So you stop school. You don't even finish the semester, right? I mean, you walk away from your class. Huh? No, I finished this, but I, so I I went to boot camp in May. So I finished the semester, and um, uh, so I, I enlisted right then, but finished the semester and went to boot camp in May. Okay, and you still had like another year to finish school at that point. Yeah, I've got a, another year and a uh, year and a half, I think, to finish school. Uh, and yeah, I turned nineteen, twenty. I turned twenty in boot camp. So, is everybody that's enlisting here in 1990 with you everybody's are you excited about going overseas and fighting and is, is your plan that i'm going to go through this boot camp and i'm going to put a gun in my hand or i'm going to get on a boat and i'm going to go out there at the time i was watching so many little navy seal movies i was like i want to go join the navy seals which is what i wanted to do and i said i, I want to see if i can do it i want to go join the seals and of course the recruiter says no problem. I, but you you don't just to get to go sign up for the SEALs. You, you go sign up for the Navy in boot camp. You raise your hand and say you want to try out. I'm like, okay, great. So raise my hand and say I want to try out and go through the tests and you know make it through the physical. I'm in decent, you know, pretty good physical shape, so I make it through the physical test. And then um, uh, I I wear glasses. These days I wear readers because I, I had LASIK a couple years, but I've worn glasses my whole life. And then like. Uh, you can't be in the seals if you don't have 20/20 vision. And LASIK was like experimental way back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And today it's actually allowed that you can go get that done. And so 4 weeks into my boot camp, my my dreams of becoming a Navy SEAL were dashed right there. And the recruiter probably knew that and said, "I ain't going to tell this kid that he's wearing glasses here." Probably so. However, you know, you can't blame the recruiter. I, I guess I could have done my own homework and figured that out. But anyway, I so no, I it regardless of whether I made it in the seals or or not, I, I wanted to do my part, serve my country, do whatever was going to ask of me right there, and um, and then come back hopefully with GI Bill and, and help pay for college. So what were, at, at, at the height of your military career, were you on a boat? Did you get overseas? or I locked out. From being in the Navy, I was never on a boat. I was on a plane the whole time. So I ended up uh, scoring well on the ASVAB, and uh, I volunteered to do basically intelligence. I did cryptology and intelligence and uh, learned Morse code and learned to listen and intercept Morse code. And I got to fly on a you know, back of a modified P-3 aircraft. And so we would go fly missions around the world on these P-3s and uh, lived in Japan for two years in Misawa, Japan, on, a, on an Air Force base in Masala and flew missions out of there. Went over to Bahrain in the Gulf for a while. And, you know, it was, it was um, you know, so different than what it ended up being in the last 20 years with, like, I've got one of my partners in the laundromat business. He was an Army Ranger, a West Point grad. And, I mean, he was in the thick of it in Afghan and Afghanistan, Afghanistan and, and uh, Iraq and that was not my experience. I was, you know, flying around, you know, thousands of feet, you know, tens of thousands of feet in the air and, and listening in on stuff and uh, in relative safety. And he was in the thick of it. So, um, but, you know, I was happy to have served, happy to have done my part and uh, to be, you know, it's one of the things I'm, I'm really proud of and grateful that I did. My, my dad worked at Grumman. So I got to be around the F-14 and the ETC, the the I was given it all the, I guess, telemetry or something. I don't know. So I kind of grew up with the, the with the Navy planes because of him, pictures and all that stuff. I actually got into an F-14 simulator one time, almost threw up at Grumman. We've got a, uh, we've got a Navy base right down, or it's Joint Reserve base now, uh, but, you know, a few miles from, from here. And I love it. On the weekends, I'll just hear those jets taking off nonstop and running their, running their patterns and uh, doing their work. I, I love listening to that. You know, we got Homestead Air Force Base here in Miami. And once in a while, those jets, I don't know what they're flying out of there, but these jets come right over the house, right? And it is loud and the house is shaking. And my brain goes, I can't imagine being in a war if these two planes just went, went over the house and the whole ground is shaking. I just can't even imagine what that's like at a 
hundred turn. When I hear that, to me, it is the sound of freedom right there. Wow. You serve for those four years. You're, you do your four years. You decide you're still not staying. Your, your whole goal was to get the GI Bill to finish your last year, uh, and you go back to TCU. But at this point now, you're you're like, what, 25? So no, now I'm, I'm because I turned 19, 22, so I'm 22 when I get out of the Navy. Yeah, I think I'm 22 when I get out of the Navy, and then go back to TCU, and I finish up what should be one more year, but because of um, just, I guess, some of the classes I took or the class I still needed, I ended up with, with finishing out two more years at TCU. Actually, that's kind of brilliant, Ken. Think about it, right? You, you start a university too young. And so now what happens is you get to finish university at the perfect age, right? You're, over, you're already 21, you're older. And, and the fascinating thing, like I was so dialed in when I got out of the Navy. I, I went back to kind of my original roots from being in military school. I, I was a 4.0 student once I got, like I was not that way through the first couple of years of college right there. But here I'm dialed in. I know what I want to do. I, I want to, you yeah, I'm really focused on what, actually, I, I didn't know exactly. I thought I wanted to be a, an attorney at that point, but I, I got really focused on just studying um, finance is what I you know, really started studying and got into and uh, learning that very at a very high level. So what, yeah, but also now socially, I think you were also in better shape, right? A university too, because your age and stuff. What did you end up getting a degree in? What were you studying? So I ended up getting a degree in finance with a concentration in real estate. And the idea was you were going to go uh, start a real estate company or what was your goal like you know Ken at like 22 graduating uni university like what did you what was your mission at that point I wanted to get into commercial real estate at that time which is funny because that's what I spent the last 20 20 years doing but I couldn't get hired um, I I interviewed about half a dozen places no one was really hiring anyone right there so what year um, is that that's like now in 92. 96. 96. 96, 96. Okay. And so 96, I'm there. Um, and the market had been kind of going strong. I remember my uncle uh, was in, in residential development. He was developing single family lots at the time and doing quite a, quite a bit of them. And I talked to him about going to work for him. And he said, Kenny said, um, you know, real estate goes in cycles. Typically it's like seven year. You said, you know, you can average about seven year cycles from highs and lows. He goes, we've been going more than seven years here because I feel like there's there's a, a, a change in the market bound to come. And uh, so he said, I could hire you on, but I'd have to keep my costs really low. I could pay you maybe you know, 25000 a year and kind of get get you going. And, uh, and then I had a, an intern in college at an insurance and investment firm. And I think they offered me, you know, 32000 a year. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a better deal. And so yeah, as an employee and not thinking that the working with my uncle could have laid the foundation and that kind of stuff and given me what I needed right there. But um, so I took the the job with the insurance and investment firm. I uh, only stayed with them actually about three years. And then I got the entrepreneurial bug Um in, in like I did a lot of modeling there. So I did spreadsheet modeling. We used insurance for estate planning and that kind of stuff. And so I did a whole lot of financial modeling using the skills that I had. And you weren't selling product. You were helping und underwrite or something. I, I was. Yeah, I was basically kind of the right hand. Uh, one of the partners there, just kind of helping him uh, you know, model the financial impacts of using insurance and how, how much insurance do you need and how to use that for based on growth rates and whatnot. So did you enjoy doing that? Did you enjoy do you enjoy that accounting? I, I'm not good on the accounting. So I still side, enjoy it. Like I'm a, I'm a spreadsheet kind of junkie. And so and I and now we put together partnerships and go buy real estate. And so I, I do that on a regular basis. I still do enjoy that part of it. And and I and I enjoyed that. But I anyway I got the entrepreneurial bug and so I went and um, opened a pizza restaurant. Okay, but stop a second. Stop a second. Right? You're, you're crunching numbers all day. You love the discipline of math, Ken. If, if there's discipline in it. Ken likes it. So, and now you just tell me, I opened up a pizza place. Ken, there's no pizza in this story up until now. So, well, I can back up a little. In college, I was a deliver. One of my jobs is I was a delivery driver for a pizza restaurant. Okay, so at TCU, this little local pizza restaurant called Parati's Pizza. I mean, the food was and still is phenomenal and but it was run is family-owned deal run by 
this the son of the family in there who like I've never seen anyone run a business more poorly than the way this guy ran his business. OK, I'm like seriously, like taken from the till, just rude to employees, rude to customers. Just I mean, I'm like this guy and they're they're crushing it in and, and their they're locations right on campus. And so I'm sitting there thinking if I could open up one of these and run it right, I mean, we would kill it. And so I actually was talking with one of my best friends from the Navy who had come back. Uh, he's from Oklahoma, but he'd come back living in, in Dallas, Fort Worth. And uh, we were roommates. I, I, don't, we, I think we were roommates at the time, but we were talking about just entrepreneurship and perhaps opening one of those. So I, I talked to their family, the family that ran the business, I said, look, I'd like to open up one of your restaurants and we love your of your concept and we'd like to, you know, they don't have, they didn't have a franchise. So what the, our plan was we would open one that's successful. We would open up four more till we had five. We would refine systems as we went through this process and we would help them uh, as the family, we would go in together and create a franchise offering and start trying to build the brand around the country. So that was kind of the overall plan. You know, I think like Mike Tyson said, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. Well, we got, <laughs> we got, punched hard in the face and, and we made a couple of key mistakes as we went into this business the most crucial ironically was a real estate mistake being that i then spent 20 years in the real estate business um i didn't know about negotiating with certain terms certain things on a shopping center we ended up taking a lot more space than we needed thinking oh we'll grow into it it's going to be great we're going to grow we're going to grow fast and grow into it that extra space came with extra everything. So it was electricity, extra, you know, electric, all utilities, extra employees. You got to have to kind of man it. And it was extra everything that we didn't plan on. And that ended up being our Achilles heel. We did, in fact, grow the business, but um, it took longer to start that growth curve. And our expense curve went up way fast. In 18 months after we opened, we filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And it was like low point in my life. I wanted to ask you how you initially uh, funded the, the, I mean, th this is expensive to start a restaurant. It's so had all of our savings, uh, credit card debt. You know, this is, it, you know, we'd read the stories about people that, you know, garage startups with credit card debt and start, you know, crushing this. And uh, so it was personal savings. There was credit card debt and there was um, a bank loan that we had taken out. So we, we had a, a bank willing to give us a loan right there. So those three things right there and had it all set up. And like I said, 18 months later, we were buried, we were underwater. Like now with the network I've got and the people, I mean, I think we could have, we could have found a buyer, we could have done a workout. There's, there's things that I know today and the network I have today where it could have been very different in, but in many ways I look back on that. And I'm like, you know what, if I'd have known how to figure that out, I'd still be in the restaurant business and thank God I'm not. So that's a that's a brutal business. Yeah, but you know, a couple things. My first business in 2004 failed by 2009, and I had the same problem. I was living off of a line of credit. That's when the more that's when the housing thing completely switched, and I lost all my money overnight. Overnight, I didn't have any cash, because so I, I kind of felt feel that right. It was depressing. I had five kids. I lost all my savings. I'm underwater. I got to start over again. I mean, it's a depressing kind of scary time. But now when you look back on it, you're like, well, things happen for a reason. I wouldn't be here today if, if that didn't, plus everything you learned, right? So. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, it's super scary when you go through that, like filing bankruptcy and shutting down a business. Well, we had employees that relied on us, suppliers that were relying on us. We had just our families, our friends. It was it was embarrassing to go through. It was, yeah, it, it was for sure a low point. But to your point, looking back, I mean, I learned a lot through that and I learned um, you know, thing, kind of like not repeating those same mistakes again. So I've learned to kind of really pay a lot more attention into the things I'm doing today. So this is 2000 to 2001 we're in the restaurant business. And then from 2001 to 2002, I stayed in that industry because that's what I knew was uh, just went to work as a GM for a regional chain. Did that for a year and um, kind of woke up one morning and realized that I was making like $50,000 a year salary. I was commuting 50 miles each way 
sometimes twice a day. Because if you're the GM, someone doesn't show back up, you're the guy that's got to be there. So sometimes twice a day, I'm making this commute, and we were pregnant with our first child. And I was like, I am never going to see my baby when she's born if this is my life. It's going to be miserable. And so I decided to make a change, and that's what brought me full circle from graduation um, into the real estate business. I, you know, this is what I wanted to do before. I'm going to get into that line of work. And I, so I interviewed a buddy of mine uh, that was a, an agent at Remax, kind of working on the residential side there. And I interviewed a uh, gentleman that my uncle had introduced me to on the commercial real estate side. Residential just didn't really float my boat much. It, it's it didn't ha have a lot of interest in me. Like when I graduated, you asked, you know, what did I what did Ken foresee? I first saw myself as like making deals, making kind of building buildings or making deals on buildings, that kind of deal. And so it's like commercial real estate was much more fascinating to me. And the guy's name was Tom Ritter, and we're sitting across from Tom's desk, and he said, Ken, we're a small shop here. We're not like the big boys. You know, we don't you know, have big fancy offices. We don't have a salary that is going to pay you. Don't have a draw that you can draw against right there. It's probably going to be 12 months before you see a dime in income because it just takes a while to build your business right there. He's like, you're going to need to bring your, your own computer. Um, got a desk. He's like, got a desk here, but you're going to need to bring your computer. And uh, But he goes, good news is you, you won't be pigeonholed in any particular asset class. I'm not going to tell you you have to work on this, that, or the other. You kind of chart your own course. And uh, that was his sales pitch. He was the broker. He was the yeah, broker because was, you need it, a broker. Yeah. It was just a small family owned shop. It was uh, it was Tom, his son-in-law and his daughter that kind of were in the business right there. And uh, but he had a really, really well established name in the town where I was living at the time. He, he they owned kind of that market for commercial real estate. And, uh, yeah, I said, well, with that kind of sales pitch, how can I say no? I said, uh, I'm in. So wait, 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 wait. So you left being a GM with an income, knowing that you may not have money coming in for months. How did you pay the bill? I don't know how you did that, because weren't you still underwater? I was underwater for 10 years after the first business. Bankruptcy cleared everything out. That's the good news about bankruptcy. It at least clears everything out where you start from zero. And my wife at the time, she was working and we had squirreled away. We had about $10,000. OK, but that's that's it. That was it in the savings. We had $10,000 and it was a huge leap of faith. Now she had a job. I think she was making probably $50,000 a year. And so we had 10,000 savings. She's making 50 grand a year and it's a leap of faith. I mean, it was a big, big leap of faith. And, um, and it was almost 12 months before I made my first dime. It was 11 months in, I closed my first deal and my part of the commission, we were on a 50-50 split with him. My part of the commission was $1,837. Oh, my God. What did you, what did you, what was this? Was it a building that you sold? Like, what was it? That particular deal was a small um, automotive building, like an automotive warehouse building is what that one was. And, but during the time over the year, it wasn't like I was just sitting around twiddling my thumbs. I mean, I was busting my ass. I was learning the industry. I was meeting people. And I remember there's a guy that, came through the office one day to meet with Tom and Tom had some deals to show him. And I talked to this guy, his name was Jim Haddock, still a friend of mine today. And I said, Jim, I said, look, I'm a relatively intelligent guy. I was like, I understand finance. I understand spreadsheets and analysis. I was like, I just don't know this business. I'm just, I'm new into it. I don't know this business, but if you will tell me what you need, if you'll show me what you need, I am your guy. I got time on my hands. I will figure this stuff out. And he kind of took me under his wing and he searched on it. This is what I, he was a, he, he was much like my uncle. He was a residential developer. So they would go buy 50 acres to a couple hundred acres. And then they would, they'd plan it. They'd plat it. They'd subdivide it and sell it to home builders is what they would do. Come develop the lot, sell it to home builders. And uh, so he started showing me what he was looking for, how to, how to look for it, what to kind of say when I went and talked to the people. And so I started just uncovering rocks for, for him and his partners. And uh, in my 12th month of business, so my 11th month, I made the $1,800. In my 12th month, I made $20,000. And, and I said, okay, this $20,000 in one check right there. I was like, 
This is our and had started to build a pipeline, right? I had other I, I started tracking everything in this. I remember I had, had these spreadsheets that tracked everything and um, uh, Tom and he'd look at that. He goes, well, don't count your chickens before they're hatched. I'm like, well, I'm not counting anything, <laughs> but I'm tracking the deals I'm working on right here. You know, I'm tracking what I'm working on. And uh, I was working on a decent pipeline. And so that second year, I made over 100 grand that second year um, because working my pipeline, working with relationships. And every year after that, I continued to kind of grow and do more and, and get better. And, uh, you know, eventually I started, you know, I, we put together our first investment deal. And went in and bought something on my own with a partner right there. So instead of just you know hustling for for brokerage commissions, went and bought something of my own. And uh, but that deal happened right in the time you're talking about in the 2008 time period. Okay, we had closed the deal. We put together a my first investment deal. We put together a six and a half acre tract, about three tracts of land. Um, six and a half acres um, on a on a thoroughfare and that backed up to uh, two holes of a golf course. And so we were going to do a uh, like a multi unit office development in there. So we're going to do an executive suite building in there and then we're going to put other like build the suit office buildings and put tenants in there and uh, either either lease or sell those buildings as, as we're building them. And we had an equity partner. So it was me and a, a buddy of mine that were both hustlers. He's now a big developer, uh, building all kinds of badass projects. And, and I was kind of a broker doing our thing. And we were both just young hustlers right there. And so we put this together. We didn't have all the money on our own, but we, we knew people that had the money at that point from being in business. Brought in an equity partner, bought the land, went and got a three and a half million dollar bank loan. Um, and we were three days from closing that bank loan when, um, our equity partner called and we're going to have to bring, I don't remember how much, but let's say another 50 grand or something to closing. And equity partner called us, says I'm out. Like, what do you mean you're out? And the markets had started, you know, it wasn't quite there yet, but they had started to collapse. And he had, this is such a lesson for anyone listening to this. I was just teaching my son this the other day and he had almost all of his real estate deals were with one bank. And, but more importantly, with that one bank, he had all of them cross collateralized. Okay. He leveraged it all. Leveraging them with multiple banks or with not, but each one of them were cross. So if one deal failed, they could call every other one of his deals right there. And, and that's what happened. One of his deals failed and they started calling his notes. And so he picked up the phone. He said, I'm out. I'm not putting another dime into a real estate deal right now. Um, and so we had, we called our bank who, was eager to do the deal, three and a half million dollar note for them. And we're like, we're out. We we can't close this deal right now because we don't have the additional equity to put into it and we can't close it. Another, you, know, you talk about a blessing because six months later, everything had fallen apart, everything. And if we had taken that note out and started building buildings right there, we just sat vacant for, frankly, the next three or four years right there before things really started to come around. So that that's when I learned how how many people were leveraging lines of credit against stocks and investment, because all of a sudden every line of credit, even mine against my home, because the, my home price went down. They started saying, no, nope, you don't have any more money there. We took it all. And then they started asking for money. Yeah, the same thing. I saw it all happen between 2008. And I had no idea how much of the country's investments were backed by the, you know, real estate and the stock market at the time. And that was like mind blowing. I was listening to another podcast this morning and it was interesting. Um, they were talking about, uh, they had just read the CPI report that had just come out and but they were talking about buried in that report was the amount of equity that's been pulled out today of the housing market in the last couple of years. So it's like, I wonder, are we repeating a, a similar pattern today that we maybe had back then? And there's there's certainly different dynamics, but if, from the home equity standpoint and the amount that's been pulled out from home equity, that was an interesting uh, stat that the guys talked about. No, it's, it's, it's kind of scary because I'm, I guess got married um, and I'm rushing to refinance the house because interest rates are already climbing. And the market here in Miami is out of control. I mean, they went up, everything went up from rent to homes 25, 30%. And now my brain's going, have fun with what your home values are because once the interest rates go up, nobody can afford that payment anymore. 
You get, something's going to give. Either you're going to stay in your house or you're going to have to lower the price because you can't have both, right? And I'm, and I'm now going to, at least Miami is one of these crazy cities. I'm going to see how much that market, but it's the same thing. You lose $150,000 of home worth and bank, banks giving you money because they can sell your house tomorrow. <laughs> not, not and when they crying. can't, that's a whole new story. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you a question. You're here with Tom. How, how long did you stay with Tom? Because I imagine after a couple of years with the money that's coming in, you don't want to give Tom 50% of it anymore. Not that you don't like him, but. After one year, Tom recognized that. And, and Tom came to me and said, hey, um, we uh, we want to make you a partner. And so what happened, it, it, again, there's only three people there, right? But it, it was me, Tom, and Mark. And Tom said, look, we uh, appreciate what you're doing here. I see good things in you. Um, and so we structured a deal that worked really well for, I think I was with them for five years. And, and the deal was, it was still a fifty. It was still a fifty percent deal, but my deal was um, uh, Tom paid all of the expenses. I would get. Uh, I would give fifty uh, percent of. Uh, what was this deal? Um, Tom would pay. Tom would pay hundred part of the expenses, but I, and I would get fifty percent. But I would get twenty five percent of any deal Tom closed and any deal Mark closed. Okay, so it was there was always something coming in and that deal worked out really well because there was constant cash flow coming in and it worked out really you know some deals you know some of these Tom would close like a whale deal and you know I'd end up with thirty thousand dollars for a deal I didn't, I never touched, right? And and it sometimes it would be the opposite deal. I closed a whale deal and half my money goes out but then goes to the other two partners. But it worked out really well like that. So we had that deal you need good partners, Matt. You need good partners. Not a lot of them. I won't. I really won't. Don't want more than one other. My first business was five of us. That did not work out. Three is really pushing it. I like my my business partner. We complement each other. It's just hard to make decisions. It's hard to the whole nine yards. Yeah, too too many is bad. But yeah, you know, with with the right partners, life is really really good. And it's, anyway, that worked out good for a while. And, and but as I started investing in more deals personally. Um, you know, Tom kind of said, well, we really did this deal because on a brokerage basis, if you're going to start investing and doing different stuff, uh, you know, spending your time on non-brokerage stuff, you know, not sure if that's going to work. And so at that point I was like, fine, I'll, I've, I'd already taken my broker's license and had my, my, you know, I, I was, I'd already become a broker. So I said, I just launched my own business and, um, uh, so I had my own brokerage for about a year. And then it was during that same time time period of, of the 08. And um, I guess in 08, I joined up with another company called Sperry Van Ness. They're out of California, big commercial brokerage shop. And, um, you know, a year later is, is when the kind of next change in trajectory of my life happened. A year later, so in 2010 of October, is there's the, all of these things happen. My, my life happens in October. So I got into the real estate, uh, filed bankruptcy. October 2001, got into the real estate business October 2002, um, left, started my own deal October 2006, I think, um, went to Sperry October 2007, and then two years later went to um, uh, KW. So Kel Williams came knocking on my door in 2009. In October 2009, I joined up with those guys, which, again, I had no interest getting involved with the residential real estate company. Um, but they had brought in, uh, recruited someone that was really influential in my life. He was a mentor of mine and a big developer and they had brought him into their folds. I was like, damn, if you're coming onto that company, it may be worth me considering. And, um, so I ended up joining up with them, you know, over time. I just, at that point started, so that was October, 2010. And so from 10 to 12, uh, from October 10 through 2012, I just started learning a lot. I started going to conferences and listening to people and learning about business building. Like I, I, I knew about, you know, creating wealth and creating some, creating money, running a more of a solopreneur kind of business. But I learned about building businesses at that point, I learned about hiring processes through the KW and, and learned, I got turned on to personal development, which I had just never paid any attention to, uh, you know, throughout my 20s and 30s in, in personal development, it was 39 when I kind of first heard that concept and uh, started following Tony Robbins and started kind of just pouring into myself and 
Um, yeah, so those next few years at KW, I really started to scale my commercial real estate business. I started building a team, building kind of infrastructure around that. And, um, uh, and then as that success started happening, I had, an, you know, I got asked if I wanted to basically become a Keller Wings franchisee and come turn around a failing business center. And, and so I did that in Abilene, Texas, went and took over. And let, let me, let me ask you a question, Ken. I, I expected that when you left Tom on good terms, that you were going to be your own sort of person at that point. I'm kind of curious, did, did KW make you feel like you were still your own person, even though you were working for them? And there, and there, and maybe there was some safety net with that. I, I'm just kind of curious why you made that choice. Well, first, it, keep in mind, first it was Sperry that I went to work with as, as, a, as a national brokerage firm. And in being just my own as a, as a broker, right? So it, it's when they just as a broker, what I felt like I needed was a national presence and kind of national um, kind of power. So that when I would show up into meetings with people that had never heard of me and didn't know who I was right there, that I had a, a strong brand behind me. Okay, so that's what that's what Sperry brought. And then KW, I was concerned about the opposite side, that this is more well known as a residential company. If I'm going out to, you know, hustle commercial deals, this is potentially a hindrance to me. But what KW does very well, and they did very well was to your point, allow you to grow your business, your brand, your everything within their umbrella. Uh, so you've got the national backing, you've got you know, a hundred thousand back back then it was fifty thousand agents around the country that you could draw on or pull on right there, and um, there was definitely an opportunity to help build your business and your brand underneath their umbrella right there, and so I I did that, and then twenty fifteen um, launched uh, Kel Williams Abilene as a market center, and built that into the number one producing you know residential or real estate firm in Abilene. Um, but that was done through partners. That was, boy, if I had to go do that again, I probably would not do it again. It was such a struggle and um, just a struggle through failed. Finding the right leader out there was so hard. I went through three people um, before I finally found the fourth, the leader that I have now. And she's she's a godsend. She's a wonderful partner. And uh, we've been partnered for a whole bunch of partners for a whole bunch of years right now. And she's in fact, taken over more and more of, of that role. I, I have a very passive role now and she manages all of that. No, oh, f- finding people is the, is one of the, I, you know, I say this to a lot, you're bringing it up. I go, uh, I, you hire fast and you fire fast because minimally 50% of the people you hire are not going to work out for one reason or the other. And the longer you wait to fire, the longer you're going to wait to find that person that you found. Uh, on the fourth go around it was in, all of mine were fairly quick on those those were all within six months from 90 days to six months they were they're gone but man that was a that was a rough couple of years and so anyway, anyway that's it's worked out we've grown that we've scaled that it's been a it's worked out well now in hindsight it, it took a whole lot of work to get it there and, and some great people to to come through and get into business with um but then during that time, so as I'm growing that, that's when it finally led us to where we are today with these other two companies. So I'm guessing, I'm going to interrupt you said, I'm guessing this person has allowed you to step back from the day to day to start thinking about what I want to do next. Now, you've basically been in finance and real estate at this point your entire career, right? I'm waiting for you to say, that I'm still incredibly passionate about this and I'm going to, this is going to be me until I retire or it's time for me to look at and do something new. And it sounds like a little bit from the apps and the other businesses that this is really something completely different. So I kind of want to get a a sense from you before we talk about what you do next, kind of what's happening to you at the time and how does your, your head get into these next two businesses? So yeah, I'll, I'll I'll just walk you through, each one of the two businesses, and but I'll tell you first. Uh, I was, I mentioned we started the Keller Williams business, and I was growing that, going through the struggles there, but finally getting some help with my real estate business that I'd really scaled it up big, and then it more or less like I had all of these people, I had like 15, 16 people on our team, and um, man, a lot of that kind of imploded. I started having 
conflicts with its people, right? It's always the people. And I started having conflicts with some of the people. And then, you know, two thirds of the team left and went and started a, a competing firm right there and doing that. And, and that really kind of gut punched me for a minute. But what I realized once I kind of settled down, I was like, okay, this opens up a whole, now that I don't have all these people to manage and to deal with, it's like it opened up the opportunity to pursue, well, really the app that I wanted to, I had been toiling with that for a few years and thinking about it, it but that opened up the opportunity. So to, to, for, to get there, I'll just reverse back. So I mentioned pizza restaurant. I've got my first child coming. She's born uh, December, 2002. She's absolutely magical beautiful little girl and this this is really cool because a couple couple things happened around that time um one i had um an attorney that i was doing business with i went out to see him when uh you were pregnant with grace he said ken he goes i gotta tell you what i do for my children he had two young boys and he said at the end of every year okay this was 2002 he's telling me this he said at the end of every year i put together, I spliced together a minute of video from each month. Okay, this is way pre-iPhone, right? This is this is like you got camcorders. But he'd say, I, I spliced together a minute of video from each month. I put it on a DVD and I put a soundtrack to it and I give them to my kid for Christmas as this is your life in 2003. Wow. Wow is right. It, still to this day, I'm wowed by that. And I was like, that's, I said, Chris, that's amazing. Uh, so I was like, can I do that? I was like, well, shit, you don't own a video camera. You don't know how to edit video. You don't know how to put anything on it. So I didn't know any of that. And nor did I really desire to learn that at the time. So, but it got me thinking, what could I do? And then the other thing that really got me was um, around that time, my um, stepmom for my birthday gave me the most beautiful gift I'd ever received. And it was this... Um, leather bound scrapbook of my life. And as I opened it up, it was, it was my baby picture from the hospital in there. And then she had a little trivia from the year I was born. And then I turned the pages and it's the story of my life on paper. And she had taken the time to write handwritten notes in the margins to kind of detail, you know, the, the texture of where we were and what we were doing, who we were with, the jokes we would tell. And man, it brought back just a flood of memories that I had frankly forgotten about. And I thought, and I, it, I knew at the moment, I was like, this is the sweetest, most thoughtful gift. I cannot imagine the hour she put into putting that together for me. And so I was thinking, wow, this is amazing. How, between you know, what my attorney's doing and what she did for me, what can I do for my kids um, that would be that for them? And what I came up with, it was just, okay, I can write. I, I, I can write down a story every once in a while for my kids. And so I literally thought, do I do pen to paper on physical journal or do I do it digitally? And the fact is I can type faster than I can write pen to paper. So I decided to do digital. Back then it was, um, you know, there, there weren't even, I don't know, there may have been laptops. I damn sure didn't have one. I had a desktop um, and, and I had a Word document. So I started writing to my daughter, Grace, at 10 months old. I wrote the first entry to her and it's just you know about how cool it was to be your dad and what I was learning and what she was doing the little things there and I wanted a rhythm that I would stick with I didn't want to be that guy that said oh I'm going to do this deal and, and let it fall apart I wanted a rhythm that I could stick with and so my commitment to myself was once a month I would write down a story for my child and that's what I did once a month and then when Knox came along you know 18 months later um, I started the same process for him. I, in fact, I wrote his first entry when his you know, mom was pregnant with him about what she was craving and that kind of stuff. And um, over the course of time, I've averaged once a month. You know, some months I'll miss, some months I'll kind of do extra. But I stuck with that and started sharing that after a couple of years with other parents, many of whom started doing it for their own kids. And they would then like text me or call me and be like, dude, this is the coolest thing I've ever done. And it means a great deal for me to be doing this. And um, so I just kept sharing that over the years. And then I moved from Word. Oh, well, I figured out in Word, you could eventually put photos in it. And then I was like, if you put too many photos in Word, everything crashes and it's a whole <laughs> shit show. And um, so in Evernote, I, I don't know when it came out, but I started using Evernote in 2012. 
And so I was like, oh, maybe I'll do my journal entries in Evernote now. So I started doing journal entries there. Then I switched to OneNote and I started doing some journal entries in there. And um, I ended up just having stuff in a bunch of different places. I had it Word, Evernote, OneNote, and in the notes of my phone. And um, a bunch of people that have been journaling to their own kids were like, Ken, what? this is kind of, it's awesome, but it's a pain in the ass. Why don't you create something to make it easier? So there's no tech. There was no single piece of tech that... Um you found. Have you been doing this for 15 plus years for your daughter? Your daughter's 20 now, right? So she's, she's 19 and I've been doing it for 19 years. Yeah. Is there a moment where you stop as, when she gets out of the house and goes to university? I mean, she's there now, really, right? right. So let me tell you that I, I gave it to her. So my whole, as I was early on in this process, yeah, I was like, you know, what I wanted to do was um, at some point, I was like, is it her 18th birthday? Is it whatever? So I, what I decided, high school graduation, it was going to be my gift to my children would be, you know, basically 18 years of, of their life through my eyes. And so she graduated last May. Oh, I've got it. I'll, I'll, um, I'll email you uh, show notes for this and I'll include it in there. I recorded it. It was freaking amazing. Okay. Um, so, so she walks into the room and uh, she had no idea this existed. Like you were able to keep it she knew it existed because prior to then, you know, about in three years ago, we started um, the app for Legacy Journal. We started the process. And so I had to get it out to the world. So she knew about it, but she's never read one. And so she knew I was doing it. She had never read one. And she didn't, she certainly didn't know I was going to be giving it to her. Um, but she walked into our living room. I have me, her mom, and, and my wife, her stepmom, are all in there together. There's like lights up in the, in the room and there's cameras. And she goes, why are there cameras in here? And I, <laughs> I got something to give you. <laughs> and, uh, and I, but, I, but I wrote her a letter. I said, hey, before I give it to you, I want to I want to read you this letter that I wrote her. And uh, so I read the letter to her and you know, she's crying. I'm crying. It's beautiful. And then I uh, then I gave her an iPad and uh, she opened up the iPad. And I was like, well, now look what's on it. And uh, what was on the iPad was her legacy journal. That I had written because I'd finally taken all of these things and I'd, I'd put them into one source in her legacy journal. And uh, it was a story of her life, you know, 18 years worth of her life. So you moved everything into this app that you were building. You had you had the app to a point. And that's, you know, if you're going to build something, I, I always believe you need to dog food it yourself. Right. If it's not working for you, it's not going to work. So you had 18 years of material to move into it. I also imagine that you found ways to import that without copy and pasting or you're getting there. I wish I would have found that it was literally a copy paste. However, I had a VA, I've, I've had a VA with me for a bunch of years. She's amazing. And so Melissa helped me a lot in, in getting some of that stuff in there. And um, yeah, so I, I ended up having it in there and that's how I gifted it to her. So one of the things we can do, you can export to an HTML and so I exported everything into a, a HTML file. I, I did this little, you know, tiny URL thing and created her own URL and and gave it to her. So it lives resident on her computer now. Wow! 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 Now that's it, what's amazing is that you actually kept up with it, even if you missed a month or so. It, you kept up with it. That to me is the most impressive thing, right? Because it wasn't easy to necessarily do. That's my most positive discipline thing I've done in my life right there is, is that one. Okay, this is interesting, right? I'm a software developer. A lot of people who listen to this show are software developers. We, we work for the big companies you've heard of all the way to little tiny startups, okay? I'm kind of curious to ask you this. You decide you want to build this app, right? It's going to have to be on the browser and it has to be, you made it both mobile, I imagine. Did you make it only to work mobile like iPad or if I log into the browser? There's a UI for that too. Man, I could write a book about the mistakes I've made and the things I've learned. And okay, my, so my frame of reference as I was thinking through this was Evernote. And Evernote, you can use browser, you can use iPad, iPhone, and, and it's, so that was my. So as I started telling people this is what I wanted, that was kind of my frame. So hey, I wanted, wanted to do these things today. If someone told me that today. I would literally slap them in the face and I'd be like, you can get that when you earn it right now. You're going to start on one platform <laughs> on one platform and you're going to do it really simple that way. But no one, no one did that to me or no one gave me that advice. And they said, yeah, we can create this. And so when, yeah, version one of this. 
Wait, 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 I, wait, wait, wait. I, I, I want to interrupt you for a second because what, what I'm curious about hearing, right? The, the app is out there. People can start using it. We'll get that into the show notes. I, I, but I want to hear from you how you arrived to the company or the people you hired to build this because it's a scare. When people come to me with these ideas, the first thing I do is I give them a budget number. If they go running, I'm like, like this is the number, and, and it doesn't stop here. This is just to build it. You got to run it after that, and you got to maintain it. So if you're not realistic about the dollars, we're already in trouble. But there's a lot of people that will just take your money knowing that it can't succeed, and you'll figure that out 12 months, so who cares? So I'm, I'm curious how you did your due diligence in picking the company slash team and kind of yet journey over the last three years, too. I'm a part of a, a mastermind group, or I was, I was heavily involved in GoBundance back then. And so I was at a, at a GoBundance mastermind, and I was kind of asking around, has anyone built an app? Anyone have experience with that? And a couple people had done that, and I was talking to one of the guys. Okay, what are what are my steps? What would I go to? He's so like, okay, first you need to wireframe it out and create a wireframe. I'm like, okay, what's a wireframe? I had no idea. Like, literally, what's a wireframe? He kind of walks me through. He tells me what it is. And so I... I sat stuck on that process for six months because I was thinking I, I'm going to wireframe it myself, but I'm like, I literally don't know how to do this. And um, I ended up, uh, I got my wireframes done. I had met a guy on a plane. Okay, so how did this happen? I met a guy on a plane that um, was part of a software company and it was telling him about what I've been doing journaling. He's like, oh my God, that's a freaking beautiful idea. I'd love to help you. They did our They did my initial wireframe. He had his team in India that that helped helped us do the initial wireframes. So once I had that, at least I had a little something out there. And then I started asking everyone I knew um, for advice or introductions to to people that might be able to help me do this in in the tech. And surprisingly, and this was 2018, 17, 18 when I'm doing this, and they're just I my connections didn't really have many connections into that world, and. Um, I ended up with a handful and I interviewed several or I had proposals come from several people. They ranged from 20 something thousand to 150,000 to kind of get this done. There's kind of my range of proposals in there. And one of the people that I had given me a, give me a proposal, I knew him personally. He had created some real estate tech that I use or I had used quite regularly. And it was great. He was great in that in that real estate part of it. And what I was really looking for, Bill, was a was a like a technical co-founder to come on and, and do this. Someone that had shared the passion that could do the the heavy lifting on the engineering on this initial thing and do it with me. But I, you know, my initial guy was not that guy. I'd hoped he was going to be that guy. He was not, and I, I just didn't know anyone in my world that was going to be that. So I hired this guy to do it. His team was in India. And they built version one for us. The guy, the company that did the wireframes. Different company, but this guy's team was in India too. This guy, this is the guy, this is the real estate guy. This is the real estate guy that uh, had built like a, a real estate financial modeling tech. And it, it really is a good software that he built there. But but he's on top of that one nonstop. He's doing the the design work. Look, I didn't know what I didn't know what UI UX meant. I didn't learn that until like a year after I would started building the app. I had no idea what that meant. So, so, so this is what I'm curious about. I, I, I'm really happy that person told you to do the wireframing first because you, you need to storyboard what, at least the data you're capturing and the flow and all of that. Without that, I always ask for that first. Like, we don't have that. We're, you know, but I'm kind of curious. I'm kind of curious. What did you think in your head it was going to cost that first year? What was kind of your budget? Um, and just the first year, right? The idea that it was done and you can put it, you can put it out there. Kind of, and you could just say percents or whatever. I, I'm not, I don't care about the actual numbers, but I, I, I want people to hear, right? Especially the engineers who, who work with clients like yourself. But I'm, right? What was your expectation? What, what was the, the reality of it? He had kind of set it up fairly, I think, um, somewhat accurate that hey, after it's built, uh, it's it's going to co even once it's up and built, it's going to cost you let's say three to four thousand dollars a month to maintain right there. Of course, here's what I was thinking. I was thinking, no problem, because as soon as this is built, I'm going to have such an influx of users that are going to pay me for this. 
it's going to be great. I, I, and that's not exactly how things work out. It doesn't happen that quickly. And um, I didn't know about you know, all the social media algorithms and how hard it is to get the word out on, on certain things. But, you know, I think that three to four grand a month was a reasonable number for him to put out there for what ongoing maintenance, hosting costs, et cetera, would, would, would cost right there. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable number. Now, here's the other problem with apps, right? There's like, I don't remember what the stats were. Maybe Andrea, who helps produce this, can remember. But I think like the average person has like five core apps on their phone that they, that they use day in and day out. And it's like nearly impossible to even be in the top 10 of apps that somebody might click on every single day. And then beyond get, getting to that, to that point, uh, revenue models are so complicated because everybody's used to getting everything for free, right? Like we live in this world right now where if it's not free, it's like, how dare you charge me for something? So I, I'm kind of curious what you kind of went into as your revenue model for the app and kind of maybe where, where are you today with it? Yeah, we settled on a freemium model um, for a couple reasons. Um, number one, just like you're saying, everyone wants something for free. Number two was I didn't want um, limitation of funds to prohibit someone from doing something like this, right? If someone was, they, they didn't have a lot of excess cash, a lot of excess money, spending money, I wanted them to be able to do this for their family forever because this is as much as anything a give back from me to the world. Um, and, and, and then number three, so we put, you know, most of our features behind, uh, I'd say, you know, most of the, what we anticipated would be the most used features kind of behind a paywall on it. And, uh, initially we had, again, I was modeling like Evernote and Quicken and different things way back. This was three years ago when we started modeling it. So I had, um, a free and three paying tiers back then. So we've migrated today. It's either free or premium, right? That's it, it's either free or premium. But back then we had three different tiers with kind of different features layered in. And, and then we had, you know, I mentioned the, the very first version, it was truly cross platform. It was web iOS and Android. Um, we had 95% of our problems coming from the integration of web with mobile and less than 5% of our users using the web. And so I ended up firing that initial tech team after, well, you talk about your own dog food, right? If it's working for you, then it's going to work for you. It was crashing for me quite a bit. And I was like, if this is crashing for me and we've got people paying for us, they're going to be really ticked off that this is crashing on them. And um, I had it crash like, you know, once on me and I, I mean, I had just written like an hour long entry about a vacation we had taken and it was gone and I was so ticked off. And so anyway, ended up uh, transitioning from that tech team, hired a new one out of Chicago. Um, they're, they're basically, they have, they have assets around the, around the country, but around the world, but uh, their core team is in Chicago and, and those guys were great. They came in, we, we deprecated, uh, we kind of shut down the web app. We went, focus solely on iOS and Android really. And, and this guy had a full-time design. One of his partners was the designer and that was a game changer for me. Cause the other guy, he didn't have a designer. It's kind of up to me to tell the guys in India, this guy came in and made it beautiful and really just it made it flow better. And I was like, Oh, this is great. So, um, re-released that app in, uh, 2021 or was it 2020? late 2020, I think we re-released the app and uh, have just kind of continued iterating on it since then. So tell me what is it, are the the pieces that you pay for, are they in-app purchases? It's recurring revenue. Uh, it's either monthly or annual recurring revenue. So, um, not, so our model is it, it's free to use the app to write journal entries. Like the kind of uniqueness about this product in, again, I, I made it to situate what I was doing as a parent, what other parents were doing. It's a, a one to many or many to many journaling platform. So I can write one story that could be for all three of my children, or I could write one story just for one of my children, or my wife can come in or um, my their grandparents, I could add them into the account. They could write stories again for 
for one or, or many of them. So you, you can have multiple what we call scribers in there on, on a paid account and on a free account, you can have, you know, you could have 10 kids or 12 kids or whatever. You can write to them all. The limitation of the basic account is um, one photo per entry in there with the paid account, you know, unlimited photos, you can add video, you can add audio files with a paid account. You can, um, tag an entry as a special tag, like a milestone. And then you can look on a visual timeline of your kid's life in my, in terms of their milestones, which is really, really kind of cool to scroll through and see like from sonogram up until high school graduation in, in their major milestones right there. So what, what are you experiencing in terms of, um, people upgrading or what is it, what does it cost to upgrade? And what are you, what are you seeing from active users? Yeah, it's either seven forty nine a month or sixty nine dollars a year is the model. Um, we have about fifteen hundred monthly active users that are using it. About eight thousand total users, fifteen hundred monthly active since the beginning of the year. So I tracked this this morning. We're at eight point nine percent conversion of, of free to paid, which is really high. That's really high. It's really high. If you look over all time, it's two percent. We have spent. Like, I mean, I can tell you, like right now, we are super scaled back today. Um, I've, I've scaled up. I've raised some money. I've scaled way up. I've, I've, I've not yet found a paid channel that's highly effective for us. Okay, We spent money. I guarantee you we spent money on paid channels. Um, but I haven't found one that has our ROI on it that is, is worth doing. What really works are guerrilla grassroots efforts. Why well, I do, I bet I do two to three podcasts a week. I talk to people, I tell our story and people listen to that like, holy shit, I want to do that. And they'll start doing it for the kids. And then uh, we were doing like deals, like we're doing a big Mother's Day deal with a whole bunch of schools right now. So we're handing out, you know, free, free promo codes for people to come in and after the experts, the promo codes, they roll into a paid plan right there. Those are being really effective. Now, can I scale that all over? Probably not, but I can you know, use that locally right now when we've got you know ten thousand total users to continue to build and build and get our following out there right now. So those are the little things we're doing. I would be really careful with all the search engine pay per click stuff. That's a black hole of just it sure is. You gotta be super careful. You know, when I first heard of the app, I don't know why, but um, Ancestor popped into my head. I connected your app with Ancestor.com. And my brain was like, is this going to be an extension of that? Or, uh, and I feel like, like there's something there between those two. It's so do I. And it's really interesting because, okay, if you look at Ancestry and the, the data, the, what they put together, right? It's this whole family story, um, but not the detailed stories. It's connecting the who's of, of what's part of your tree right there. And maybe there's news stories on this person, or maybe they're historical figures that you know a little bit about them, but it is rarely their personal stories that they're writing about their family members. And so I think there is a deep tie between what we're doing and ultimately what Ancestry is doing down the road. And that's, you know, that's something we'd love to explore with them as, as we get to a, a bigger point of scale. Yeah, I think, I think some form of integration between that would really help. Yeah, we talked about like some type of API integration where so if you're an ancestry and it kind of lights up saying, hey, you've got so and so has got and then you've got all of this other rich detail of story that's come along with it. It's uh, some of our, our power users, uh, big power users are, are, you know, from Utah, part of the Mormon, you know, ancestry's I think, owned by the Mormon church and um, some of our power users are exactly doing that kind of thing, telling their story and, and using our platform to do that. But now you have to think about what you want to share. Maybe I don't, I mean, I would love for, let's say your daughter to share that story with the world in some with ancestry or not, right? But maybe people don't want to share it either. So there's that sort of privacy. And then even in Europe, have you thought about, uh, or is it DT, what is it? I can't remember this, the acronym for privacy out there in Europe. But uh, D, I can't remember. Off I, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yes. Um, you got to think about all that stuff now too, right? Yeah. It, that, so interesting. Yes, I don't know about that. But thinking through my, my, my thought on the ancestry kind of integration is that it would be an opt-in anyway, that it, it wouldn't be something that would be automatically shared right there. That if there's an API, it would, in essence, just illuminate, you know, hey, Bill, you've got a relative that's also on this platform 
that may have a you know, deeper connection right there. And then you can kind of connect with them on that. Cause you're exactly right. Like my stories are super private to my kids and it's designed to be that way. Like when I'm dead, I'd love for it to be all out there. But right now it's, yeah, you know, a lot of those are, are man, super private. Yeah. Uh, it was GDP. Uh, why couldn't we? GDPR. GD, yeah. GDPR. Yeah. Where somebody can just come and say, wipe it all out. I don't want no, not even a bit of data anymore about me on your platform, right? Because um, it's private data, really. At the end of the day, the personal stories, it's private data. This is big time private data. Yeah, this is, uh, and this is, what I, this is I, I tell people, it's kind of like the anti-social media. Right? This is not at all social media. This is your private media that's your stories, your platform that you share one-on-one -on -one with someone. If you, know, if you want to bring other subscribers into, like when um, one of the features on our paid plan is you can add, again, what we call multiple subscribers, but you can then give each one of those subscribers two levels of permission. You can give them permission to only see what they've written or to see everything that's been written right there. And so um, if you just want to bring someone in and only let them see the entries that they've created, you can limit them to that. So uh, we got like five minutes left and I'm curious how, how does it feel for you to have this thing alive, right? I mean, it, you, you dreamt about it for a long time and now you have it in your hands. Like that's gotta be magical for you. Yes, it's been, it, it's been awesome. And what really, fuels me is I, I, I all the time I send emails out to our, our you know, power users and ask for interviews. And so I've got four in the next week with with our you know, customers that are really using the product. And that's what fuels me up is when I hear their stories and what it's meaning to them, how they're using it. I'm learning so much about how other people are using it and um, that it, it feels amazing. And it will, you know, it will feel even more amazing when we hit, hit a certain level of scale and and like I'm still feeding this thing right now. I mean, okay, but there's reality. I'm still feeding this thing. We're uh, we're not where we need to be, but we're getting a lot closer. It, this is gonna. This is a, a marathon. We we built an app, um, a weather app that Navy captains are using. Okay, and I think people pay a couple bucks, and that's it. We're like we didn't make it to have money. We made it because we needed it ourselves as fishermen, right? I got Navy captains working, and I think it pays. It's the amount of money that comes in now every month pays for it, right? We ain't making money, but it ain't costing us any money. Like that to me is your first milestone. When the app is covering its its um, cost, that's like a big, big, big win. But it's that's what we're pushing. That that's exactly what we're pushing for right now. And uh, that that is a. Uh... I heard on uh, someone say the other day, they were quoting someone saying that the, the main thing needs to be the main thing. And that is our main thing with, with that company right there. It's, it's self-sustainability to where the revenue covers the cost. So now that the name Legacy of Love really makes a lot of sense to me. Tell me the few minutes we have left. Where did the idea of Legacy of Love come from? And then is there other things in the pipeline that you can share that maybe also kind of come into this family of legacy of love. What I called this thing forever was from my heart to yours. I mean, honestly, that's um, anytime I thought through this, it was always me writing from my heart to my children's right there. And so I, you know, I'm not an app namer or anything like there, but when I went to, when I went to go register the domain name from my heart to yours, um, like weeks before someone had registered it and I was like, are you kidding me? I guarantee you it's some jackass that I talked to because I was, I was pretty liberal about just sharing that out there. And uh, I guarantee it's something like that, that, that they went and took it. But so then I started just searching and thinking and thinking and, and um, legacy was a really important component to what we were doing right there and what I felt like this was doing. And then, I mean, legacy love just sounded right. I will tell you the one uh, I don't, it's, it's not regret. the one observation I've had from, from now putting legacy of love as the corporate name is I have Google searches set up every day for any time legacy of love is, is in 85 to 90% of the time it's about dead people. Okay. It's like, Oh, they left behind a legacy of love. And I was like, I wish I would have run that Google search for a few weeks before I decided. Um, however, it does, it doesn't change what we are creating is in fact that, but it's just, it's an interesting side note that that's, uh, what they're, what they're creating. Well, now you're adding life to that, right? So I, I don't think it's, I think it's good. I, I think that's good. I imagine, you remember, we, we, you start off in military school 
and finance and spreadsheets and all of that. And now you're building an app that um, emotionally connect, like you're on the other side of the spectrum of basically, right? You're, you're connecting people emotionally. But I have to imagine you're doing the books for the, for the company. So you're getting your, uh, yeah, and I, I'm in, your now I'm in, instead of spreadsheets, I'm in mix panel, right? So I'm in mix panel <laughs> learning all that stuff now. It's crazy. Um, I, a couple more questions. Your wife, your wife, um, does she, what is, was she, I, I imagine she was supportive throughout this entire process, right? From you having to do all of this. Does she participate also or did participate at all in the journal entries or like? So my, my, so I, I'm remarried to myself. So my first wife, who was Knox and Grace, my older two's mom, um, does not participate. It has been very supportive of this whole endeavor and everything, but um, it's just always kind of my thing and uh, doesn't participate, hasn't ever written. Amber, um, Amber and I now have a six-year-old, and um, she writes journals to Kai a bunch, and it's super cool. So she's in there, she'll write, because it's just a different perspective than what I've got right there. She has a totally different perspective, and so yes, she uh, she also contributes and, and writes in there, but she's been 100% supportive of this, um, and has, you know, has been side-by-side side with me through the, the, the highs and the many, many lows. I mean, you know, as a founder, uh, man, it can be a, a punch in the face a lot of times, and, and she's been there 100% supportive through the whole thing. You, you need a partner that's still with you when you're hitting those lows and not making it worse uh, because yeah you can't quit right you know but you got to also make the right decision to stop you need a partner in your life without it you it's rough it makes it worse so i'm glad to hear that I'm glad to hear it all right ken we are out of time we're going to make sure in the show notes we have um, all of that information about the app but if anybody wants to reach out to you after listening to the podcast what's the best way that they can uh, reach out. You're welcome to email me if you want to email and, and get advice or anything there. It's Ken at Legacy of Love dot APP. Legacy of L O F L O V E dot APP. Um, you can learn more about the app at Legacy Journal dot APP. I'm on social. Uh, I don't use social a lot, but I'm on uh, probably Facebook is one I'm on a couple times a week at least. And it's uh, at uh, Lord Wimberly on Facebook. Brilliant. We'll get all that in the show notes as well. All right. Well, Ken, thank you for spending all this time with us. Super interesting story. Really impressive that you were you had a vision for an app and you got it built and it's out there helping people. And for sure, I'm going to be uh, sharing that with my uh, wife when we get home. <laughs> now, you know, she loves she loves doing that stuff. But having a platform for it's really nice, I think, because it provides that structure instead of a a notebook, right? At the end of the day. So I'm, I'm definitely going to share that with her uh, today and see. I think it's important. Anyway, this is Bill and Ken Wimberly thanking you for uh, joining us uh, for the Arn Labs podcast and hope to see everybody again real soon.